Your actions can only be described as an act of pure evil. Evil. Tell us what happened when you lost it. I lost it. I accidentally shot him. Huh? I accidentally shot him. You accidentally shot him? Well, and try to make me do what is it, gay. What he tried to make me do. He tried to make me shot him. Dan did? Yeah, because his mom wanted to. This is 16-year-old Gavin Smith. In December 2020, he butchered his entire family and hid at his girlfriend's house. His reason for the four murders is outrageous. As the numbness took over my body, I tried to comprehend how someone could have so much hatred to eliminate four people, including his own flesh and blood in such a violent and cowardly way. But that is not the only outrageous thing that would come up during his interrogation. This is the full story of Gavin Smith. It was a brisk winter day in Elkview, Kanawha County, West Virginia. Elkview is a very tiny place on the outskirts of Charleston. Only around a thousand people live there and you know how it goes in tiny towns. People feel like they know each other and therefore they can trust each other. So it's always shocking when they're proven otherwise. On December 13th, 2020, a family friend of Gavin Smith's parents decided to visit their home on Cemetery Hill Drive. The family had been out of reach for two days, and they were getting really worried. It was unlike them to not pick up or respond to messages. The friend knocked on the front door a few times and waited. Then they tried again, but as no one answered, they tried the door. Lo and behold, it was unlocked. The friend entered the house and began to snoop around, hoping to find at least one of the family members. When they saw the master bedroom door was closed, they began to feel that horror movie dread. They opened the door and discovered a massacre. 37-year-old Daniel Dale Long and 39-year-old Risa Mae Saunders were in bed. They had been shot in the head and blood had poured down their faces and onto the bed. They still had their eyes open and they were staring at the ceiling. At the foot of the bed, another person lay dead. 12-year-old Gage Ripley. He'd also been shot in the head. And in his crib, three-year-old Jameson Long had suffered the same fate just down the hall. Whoever had shot him in the head had also cut his throat, making sure he wouldn't survive. The scene was scarring enough to the first responders, let alone the family friend who had to discover it all. As soon as the police arrived at the scene, they asked the friend who else lived at the family home. One person was missing, 16-year-old Gavin Smith. Homicide detectives know two scenarios in cases like these. A, someone led a targeted attack on the family and kidnapped the missing family member, or B, the missing family member is the main suspect. In most cases where the whole family is killed, it is a relative who did it. It's sad and ironic, but the detectives in Elkview knew this so they knew finding Gavin was their number one priority. Within an hour, Gavin was tracked down to his girlfriend's house. 17-year-old Rebecca Lynn Walker and Gavin Smith were taken into police custody for questioning. When Rebecca was interrogated, she was fiercely defensive of Gavin. She said, yeah, he did it. He killed his family, but he had an excellent reason to do so. According to Rebecca, Gavin had been brutally abused by his stepfather, Dan, for years on end. As it got worse and worse, Gavin started fearing for his life. Finally, he snapped. He grabbed his stepdad's gun from his locker and killed his entire family. Um, sure, but why kill his mother and little brothers too? What had they ever done? Rebecca said Gavin felt immediate remorse and quite a lot of panic when he realized what he'd done. Apparently he was experiencing some sort of blackout when he did it and he had no control over his actions. So he put the gun back and rushed to Rebecca's home where he'd been staying for the last couple of nights. Rebecca insisted that Gavin was remorseful and put between a rock and a hard place. He could either kill his stepfather or wait till his stepdad killed him. Any seasoned detective knows not to take a suspect's word for granted. So while they listened patiently for Rebecca to tell her story, they also researched her claims of abuse. The police scoured through family history and asked all witnesses if Dan had ever been abusive to Gavin or anyone in his family. As it turns out, he 
wasn't. Dan had no history of violence. The child protection services had never been called to the house, and no one at Gavin or the other children's schools had any such reports. So the detectives were right in being skeptical of Rebecca. It was time to interview Gavin. Hey, do you already? Uh, no. no, no. You didn't wait on me, did you? <laughs> yeah. I'm just going to wait. I know. I don't really like laying these bodies. Oh, you don't? No. If you guys want it, you can have it. There's a scout that we work with in our office. That's all he'll eat. He's going for fours when we go to Wendy's. They're good. That's pretty good. Would you get the ginger bacon or the crispy chicken? Uh, ginger bacon. That's what I know. This is probably not your first interrogation, so you know detectives tend to build rapport before they do anything else. That way, they ensure the suspect feels at ease and ready to open up about their crimes. They also establish a baseline behavior. Now, they know how Gavin behaves when he's relaxed. The moment he starts lying, they'll notice a shift in his behavior and they'll be able to call him out on it. He's on a diet, so he just eats cheetos. I can tell. <laughs> he needs to get on a new one, doesn't he? Yeah. So you say you're in the ninth grade? Mm-hmm. And how's all this e-learning stuff going? Um, way difficult. <laughs> because I'm used to going to school and doing it in class, not in... Indeed, this was happening in the middle of the COVID-19 pandemic, and Gavin was studying from home that year. He said that he preferred being at Hoover High School with his friends rather than cooped up in his bedroom. I mean, if this COVID stuff would want to happen, I'd be having good grades and all that, but I'm having bad now. Did y'all usually get good grades? Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a lot of high school kids that are wanting to not go to school and just want to do it from home. Yeah. Although Gavin is supposed to feel at ease during this part of the interrogation, he's already visibly anxious. He's looking around the room, back and forth between the detective and holding a tense position with his hand on his thigh. So you, did we understand well enough for you what's going on up here when we were back up there at Riverhaven, mm -hmm. your girlfriend's house? Yeah. We explained to you everything that's going on and are you still good with us? That, that form that we explained to you it still applies, okay? Yeah. It was time to ask the serious questions. However, the detective started out with the possibility that Gavin was the victim of abuse. This way, he gave him an opportunity to explain his actions. And we and we and we deal with a lot of families that um, that the parents mistreat the children, and um, there's domestic violence in the home, child maltreatment. Child, child sexual abuse, child abuse, there's all types of different things that we deal with, okay? Yes. By giving Gavin a chance to justify his crimes, the detective made the question much less confrontational. It seemed like they were on his side. He could just be honest with the cops. Well, sometimes down April, my stepdad used to abuse me all the time if I didn't do something he wanted or something like that. I, okay. And I would send my girlfriend photos of the bruises and wear mops and all that. And any time he didn't get his way, he would help me. And oh, yeah. so with my mom, like she punched me in the mouth a couple times because I didn't do what she wanted. Gavin explained that Dan joined his family when he was in sixth grade. According to Gavin, the abuse only started in April of that year. So some eight months prior to the murders. Well, we had a lot of family problems. Like my aunt, she has cancer down in her area and on our, and my grandmother passed away in 2013 and Dan started blaming me for her death and all that saying I was the one gave it to her and which you can't give a cancer. Right. It just been bad thing, you know? Gavin said Dan was only mean to him, not his other stepson Gage or his biological son Jameson. This is the heartbreaking bit. I wish I knew because I take care of Jameson all the time. Like, they, he calls me daddy, which is a bad thing since I'm his oldest brother. Jameson called him daddy, and Gavin shot him in the head and cut his throat. But for Gavin, having to take care of a baby was frustrating. Because I've been taking care of him since day one, since he got out of the hospital. Mm -hmm. It just been hard. So we can slowly start to understand why Gavin wanted to kill his entire family. Okay. Now is your real dad? Is he your real? I actually don't know where he is. I actually never met him. You never met your real dad? I wanted to, but I never met him. 
by saying he wanted to meet his dad, but couldn't. Gavin is also letting the cops know his mother was overbearing and did not fulfill his needs. What about your mom? How are you and your mom get along? Not well. I don't talk to her at all. You don't? No. Yeah. Okay. What about your little brothers? No, I usually just talk to James and make them all happy. But they don't have to them. If Gavin was truly abused by his parents this way, then even though murder isn't justified that easily, the court could find leniency when it came to his punishment. But holes and discrepancies were already appearing in his story. First, why did Gavin say his dad started to abuse him in April 2020? Child abuse is usually gradual and spans years. It doesn't just start suddenly. Secondly, Gavin complained that he was forced to raise Jameson since the day he was born. But Jameson was three. So if this was one of the forms of abuse he was subjected to, hadn't the abuse started in 2017? Gavin's conflicting stories would only get worse. How long have you been at uh, your girlfriend's house? A couple of days. Okay. And tell us about how you ended up there. Well, she asked me to come over because she just needed help with school and I wanted to come over and I asked my stepdad, well, my mom, Let's go over there and they said, yeah, just be back by Tuesday. And that not been no sense. Wait, what? Did he think the cops didn't know that he killed his family? The cops simply moved on to other questions about Gavin and Rebecca's relationship. They had been dating for nine months and had mainly communicated over Skype and Instagram. When the cops asked Gavin if he had a cell phone, he went straight back to the abuse stories. Do you have a cell phone? No, because the last time I had a cell phone, I danced my step. I don't, yeah, I don't. He found out I was telling him that for what's been going on. But how many abuse tales could the detectives listen to before they revealed what they knew? When we talked to you up there, you said you're, they're, you're family, some of your family members are deceased. Okay. You know what that means? They're dead, right? Yeah. Um, there's a lot, of, a lot of evidence in this case. I think you mentioned where up the road there that you watch a lot of these shows and you see how a lot of this stuff goes. So you know what, what, we can do as cops yeah. to figure out how things happen, right? Yes, sir. The detective tried to paint the obvious picture that they saw, just so Gavin could understand how clear it was he was the main suspect. And then you're gone, and we find you at your girlfriend's house. We find your girlfriend and talk to your girlfriend, and your girlfriend's she's coming off on everything, okay? She's telling us everything that you've told her about what happened at your house, okay? Gavin now knows the police have evidence against him and that Rebecca had already told them he killed his family. However, Gavin doesn't know exactly what evidence the police have against him. He's clearly anxious, bouncing his leg, and constantly touching his face. These are self-soothing mechanisms, meant to make the person feel safe. But the detectives see right through it. Gavin now has to choose between giving the full truth or telling more lies to get out of the previous lie. Guess what he does? Well, after I, I told you the abuse and all that, a um, mm -hmm. couple of days ago, before all this happened, I didn't know of, um, me and my mom was cooking, and I told her, well, I tried to open up to her, and she just said I faked it all because I'm currently depressed, saying I fake cut myself, which I have cut myself yet, uh, for a couple months. Okay. And you can't fake cut yourself. Then, overhauled it, and he hauled me right back. He grabbed me right here, and he punched me right, um, he hit me right in the dick when he grabbed me in the shoulder. I just, I went to bed, and I just fell asleep crying in pain. Still, Gavin insisted that he didn't kill his family. He just left to Rebecca's for the weekend, and then the murders happened. He even went as far as suggesting other killers for the police to look into. Because I know, for that's my mom, uh, she talked to me about it. She has a couple of people that wants to kill her. But I got no sweetness. The detective had to remind him they already knew the whole story from Rebecca. They just needed a motive. Dan has been trying to kill me the past few days. Okay. Like he would, he cut me right there. Okay. With a knife. Okay. Yeah, and then. Now he's been just trying to kill me while they can. Gavin pointed out to a small knife cut minutes after saying he'd been cutting himself. When he told the cops the stepdad had hit him in the crotch, he also mentioned the marks aren't visible anymore. So he had no way to prove he was abused and he kept throwing fresh abuse stories at the cops whenever they would ask him to admit to the murders. 
The single thing the detectives found when looking into the family abuse was that Gavin's parents would sometimes put a lock on the fridge to stop Gavin from overeating. If that's abuse, it certainly doesn't warrant butchering your entire family. Well, you told your girlfriend that you killed your family, okay? I don't regret it. And you regret it? No. Here's the first truth that came out of Gavin's mouth. He did not regret murdering his family. That day, um, that morning, Dan, he put his gun to my head and tried to make me do what is, it's gay, what he tried to make me do. He tried to make me stop him. Dan did? Yeah, because mom wanted to do it anymore. Huh? She took a small one to do it anymore. Sheesh. And to think, that's what he came up with as an excuse for his actions. Gavin simply said he lost it when Dan tried to violate him. Tell us what happened when you lost it. I lost him. I accidentally shot him. Huh? I accidentally shot him. You accidentally shot him? Well. How do you accidentally shoot four people? I didn't realize what I was doing. <laughs> what do you mean by that? Yes, I was a thinking straight. And then not thinking straight is not the same thing as shooting someone by accident. Gavin explained that first he shot Dan in the head, then he did the same to his mom, and then Gage, and then Jameson. His parents were asleep in bed, so he knew that they would be at their most vulnerable. Listen to what he adds after saying that he killed his parents. And I got done with that, Gage, I walked Gemma, my dog. And I came back in and Gage was trying to kill Jay. He put the knife to his James' and started trying to sit it and I shot Gage one in the head. Why would Gage also try to kill his family at the same time? Because James wanted to shut up. He was screaming, crying. Is it possible Gavin is so far gone that he doesn't realize that not everyone would kill a baby for crying? Less than an hour into the interrogation, Gavin told a long list of lies. First, there was no mention of the essay when the police just asked about Dan's abuse. Second, he snapped and killed his dad when he tried to force himself on him. Then, he said he shot his parents while they were asleep on their bed. So which one was it? Why did you shoot James? Because he was bleeding from my hair. But you can't save someone if you slit someone's throat. Oh, so killing your baby brother was an act of mercy? Because your suddenly murderous prepubescent brother slit his throat to make him shut up? Did Gavin truly believe his cops would buy his story? Did you cut Jameson's throat? Yeah, Gage did. Before I shot Gage. I popped Mr. Gage since day one. Then, the detectives told Gavin that as per all homicide investigations, a forensics team would be collecting DNA from the crime scene. When they asked him if they would find DNA on the knife used to cut Jameson's throat, he had an explanation for why they would. Yeah, after I killed Gage, I tucked, I tucked the knife and I put it back, I put it on the shelf in the hallway. Well, Gavin, I think, I think what we're, well, I'm getting, I don't think Gavin I mean, I don't think uh, Gage cut Jameson's throat. I think you did. Gavin just said maybe he messed up how it all happened. He just wasn't thinking straight. I got it on that step. I'm sorry. After I killed Gage, I had a knife in my hands, but I can't do it. So I put the knife on the shelf and I shot Jay. According to Gavin, he grabbed the knife to hurt himself after killing his family. What's interesting though is only his baby brother was hurt by the knife, but Gavin still denied cutting his throat. When the detective reminded him the forensics team will examine Jameson, here's what he said. I know. Well, man, he, he had a little tiny cut, but that was a couple of days ago, like before all this happened. Because with me and him was playing and he caught the edge of his neck off of one of the toys. Honestly, we don't have time to stop the video every time Gavin tells a lie. So what made you want to do all this? The abuse, not that I couldn't tell him anymore. Because he's Dan, he's been trying to kill me constantly. Did, uh, did the police ever get called to your house for anything? 
No, not that I know of. By saying that, the detective lets Gavin know he knows he's fabricating the abuse. The police already knew there was no record of CPS or police coming to the Smith home. Also, the million dollar question. Well, how come you didn't call the police or tell CPS about this if you came in contact with Ray? If I came in contact with CPS, I'll let him know. Gavin said he didn't have access to a phone, but he also said he sent pictures of bruises to Rebecca and that he did have a phone, but Dan smashed it. Also, other people in the house would have had phones, including his brother Gage or his mother. I was so scared because Dan Dunn said if I ever told anyone that he would physically help me so bad that I'd be in the hospital. Sadly, this is true for many child abuse victims. The attacker often threatens their victim that they would get killed or arrested if they spoke up about it. It's truly sickening that Gavin is abusing the system in this way. He knows the best thing to do for himself is to play the victim. He has seen enough movies or documentaries to concoct stories of horrific abuse and paint himself as an innocent child who had no choice but to kill his family. Through his lies, Gavin made it clear he has no remorse for his murders. His interrogation would have one last outrageous twist. Then the true motive of his murders would be revealed. When the detectives asked Gavin why he killed his brothers, Gavin added that Gage would also beat him as Dan would hold him immobilized. When the detectives asked him when his stepdad tried to make him do the horrible thing, Gavin said from September to November. So not on the day he snapped, in December. Then Gavin said he told Rebecca about his plan to murder his family three days before he did it. So no, he didn't just snap that day. It was premeditated murder. If then this would happen, Dan abused me and all that. That's right, blame it on Dan. Even if Gavin was abused, not all abused children murder their families. In fact, very few actually attack their families at all. Gavin could have run, he could have asked Rebecca to call the police or CPS if he didn't have a phone. He could have done so many things before actually murdering his entire family. And it was even worse, considering all those stories about Dan were completely false. Anything you wanna to say to us or? I'm sorry for wasting your guys' time. But it's not a waste of our time, it's a serious thing. I mean, I'm always honest with cops. Uh-huh. As the interrogation ended, the detectives realized they still didn't have the murder motive. They now knew it was premeditated murder and that Dan had never abused Gavin. The detectives then spoke to Buster, Gavin's grandfather and his closest relative. Gavin confided in him when he felt he couldn't talk to his family and he confessed to this during the interrogation. Buster told the cops a bit of crucial information. Gavin's family did not like Rebecca. Shortly before the murders, Gavin's parents barred him from speaking to her or seeing her. The detectives recovered over 15,000 messages from Gavin's social media to and from Rebecca and hundreds of hours of phone calls. In none of these calls or messages did they talk about his family abusing him. Instead, Gavin was frustrated with his parents and their resistance towards the teen's relationship. Gavin said he wished his parents weren't around to interfere with their love and how he dreamed of being with Rebecca all the time. Rebecca not only agreed with Gavin's feelings, she literally encouraged him to do something about this. During one of the video calls, Rebecca pushed him to take action one last time. Then Gavin said he came up with a plan. He would kill his parents, blame it on abuse, and dodge prison. Then they could be together. Rebecca was happy about this plan. In fact, she watched the murders from the comfort of her home. The two had a video call during the massacre. After he killed his family, Gavin cycled to Rebecca's house and she rewarded him for his bravery by giving him a hickey. When the detectives confronted Rebecca with this new information, she broke down and confirmed everything. Also, she broke up with Gavin. Isn't that karma? Rebecca testified against Gavin for a plea deal and 10 years in prison. In 2022, Gavin was tried as an adult. He continued to point his fingers at his family and even at Rebecca, claiming she made him do it. Shockingly, Gavin pleaded not guilty. Six hours later, the jury found him guilty on three counts of first degree murder, one count of second degree murder, and one count of using a firearm during a felony. You executed your mother and stepfather by shooting them in the head while they were asleep. 
Then you executed your two brothers by shooting them in the head. The youngest witch was hiding under his crib. The timeline goes as follows. Gavin decided to kill his parents so that he could be with his girlfriend. He shot them in the head while they were both asleep, knowing they would be defenseless. Hearing the noise, Gage came running upstairs. As he was just discovering the crime scene, Gavin shot him in the head too. That's where the second degree murder charge comes from. Then, Gavin decided to kill Jameson too. Your actions can only be described as an act of pure evil. Evil. I find that you have zero remorse for your actions. On December 8th, 2022, Gavin received three life sentences, 40 years for the second degree murder and 10 years for the gun charge. Because of his age at the time of the murders, he will be able to see the parole board after 15 years. That's what the law of West Virginia states. But it's highly unlikely he will ever be granted parole. I watched the dynamics of the relationship with Gavin and his brother Jameson. I cannot comprehend how he could have taken his brother's life along with the lives of Daniel, Risa, and Gage. As the numbness took over my body, I tried to comprehend how someone could have so much hatred to eliminate four people, including his own flesh and blood, in such a violent and cowardly way. Gavin was indeed a coward. He destroyed a family and left many others in shatters. I don't know if she had ever met my grandkids and my daughter, but these are what they look like. For Timothy Saunders, the loss is too much. Now, all I have is grace to visit headstones. His only daughter and grandchildren that he says would still be alive if she came forward. No warnings, no calls were made. So now I have lost my family. Rebecca is a pretty shocking case too. What person would egg her partner on to kill his family just so she could see him more? And the fact that she broke up with him as soon as he got arrested would almost be funny in another context. But it's never funny when an innocent family dies for a teenager's delusion. Hey, thanks for watching. What are your thoughts on this case? Do you know of other similar cases? Let me know in a comment, and before you go, make sure you like, subscribe, and hit that bell button. See you next time, and stay safe.